16th, the TOC Executive Committee revised the TOC Memorandum of Understanding, which provides our authority and operating framework. The revised MOU responds to concerns identified by FTA, the NTSB, and Congress by providing additional authority to the TOC Chair and allowing the Executive Committee to take any action permitted by law, including suspending state capital funding in the unlikely event that all options to resolve TOC safety concerns have been exhausted. Since the arrival of WMATA Interim General Manager Richard Sarles, the talk has been pleased to note that safety has been placed not just at the forefront of WMATA's rhetoric, but of their efforts as well. His regular presence at talk meetings, safety performance metrics, and long overdue restructuring of the WMATA Executive Safety Committee have guided a comprehensive response to the system's safety challenges. He's also hired several safety experts, including James Doherty as Chief Safety Officer. The Safety Department is investing in new systems and processes to streamline their investigations, resolve open corrective actions, and improve their auditing capacity. A good example of this new approach is the recent completion of WMATA's Roadway Worker Protection, or RWP, manual, which leadership recently signed into effect. By bringing together safety, operations, labor, and management employees, as well as soliciting input from outside agencies and experts, WMATA has created a comprehensive document that will improve safety on the tracks. WMATA also recently revised their rule book, complying with long-standing TOC and NTSB recommendations, and acknowledged the need to develop a non-punitive safety reporting system, although this essential step remains a work in progress. Yet despite advances, WMATA's organizational culture must become willing to show their work. A recent example came July 4th weekend when WMATA removed all 4,000 series rail cars after technicians discovered a potential fault that could allow train doors to open during movement. There is no question that WMATA's immediate response was the safest course of action, but our attempts to learn more were delayed. On July 6, we asked for more information about this decision and for any procedure for the door repairs and received conflicting answers. Twenty days later, we received a copy of the full procedure, learning it had been in effect since three days after our original request. Our request for information about the reasoning behind this decision took even longer. Our difficulty in obtaining information during the process just demonstrates that our need for timely and accurate information must, con must become a high priority. WMATA faces real challenges to the goal of becoming America's rail transit safety leader. However, if they can promote transparency, empower the safety department, hold managers accountable for safety goals, and improve hazard communication as has begun, it will grow safer, smarter, and stronger as an agency. Continued engagement on the part of the Congress, the FTA, the NTSB, and the riding public, as well as the talk in our state safety oversight role, will be crucial to their success in sustaining their progress. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Mr. Garland. Good afternoon, Congressman uh, Norton, members of the committee and others. Thank you, Congressman Norton, for inviting ATU Local 689, the largest transit workers union in the nation's capital and the third largest transit union in the nation, to testify before you. I am here today to speak on behalf of the union's president, Jackie Jeter, and our members. Over the past several years, we have made several recommendations to WMATA that we expect will improve management, employees' uh, preparedness, riders and workers' safety, and safety of the public. Please allow me to explain some of the most important. We believe that these are consistent with the proposed federal legislation. Number one, development of comprehensive safety plans that mirror the proposed national plan. The WMATA plan should result from a collaborative effort between WMATA and the union and require all parties to adhere to it. Number two, union representatives should be, a member, should be members of the WMATA board of directors and the safety inspection teams. Number three, Retraining plans must be developed and implemented for the entire workforce and likewise certification and recertification of safety personnel should be become routine and ongoing throughout the worker's career. Number four, equipment upgrades must meet safety performance criteria and conf conform to a minimum safety performance standards consistent with national standards or if set at a higher level by our jurisdiction then those standards should be maintained. Number five, Deferred maintenance must be given priority and a timely uh, set for completion. Number six, specific, term, sp specific items, replacement parts, or new uh, mechanisms, new procedures within the systems must be addressed within a specified time frame, then tested and evaluated immediately. Adjustments and revisions must be completed within a specified period and retested completed uh, prior to any implementation. Number seven, the results of any equipment or process failure should be made public 
promptly and the report should be disseminated immediately to affected divisions and personnel within the WMATAs and the union workforce. Number eight, we support the inclusion of oversight from external entities with enforcement powers. Number nine, we believe that noncompliance should be sanctioned and that improvements should be funded by the federal government and the three jurisdictions provided mass transit to the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Going forward, WMATA needs to admit to its workforce that there have been problems in the past and is committed to moving forward with greater emphasis placed on awareness. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, moving forward with greater emphasis placed on awareness, dispersal of inf information, and willingness to work collaboratively with the union on behalf of its employees. Thank you for your time and attention this afternoon. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Garland. Mr. DiBernardo. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Norton. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Francis DiBernardo, and I serve as the 2010 chair of the WMATA Riders Advisory Council. The Riders Advisory Council serves as the rider's voice within Metro. The council provides feedback to the board and customer input to Metro staff. Members use Metro's transit services, Metro Bus, Metro Rail, and Metro Access, and represent a diverse mix of ages, backgrounds, and ways in which they use the system. Your invitation letter noted that this hearing would focus on the NTSB's railroad accident report on the June 22, 2009 Metro Rail collision and the shortcomings in Metro Rail's in Metro's internal communications and its ineffective safety culture. Since the Riders Advisory Council is specifically composed of non-Metro employees, it will be difficult for me to comment on Metro's internal workings. Instead, I would like to focus my testimony today on how Metro's communications with its external stakeholders, namely its riders, affect safety and how, as it rebuilds its safety culture, Metro must include riders in that effort. As the NTSB's report noted, several factors, human and mechanical, contributed to the 2009 collision. The Council is confident that under the leadership of Interim General Manager Sauls, Metro has been identifying and addressing the mechanical factors that contributed to last year's collision. However, in addressing safety, Metro cannot only look inward for solutions. It must also look to its 1.2 million daily customers about how to address safety. In the wake of last year's crash, the focus has been on the safety of the train control system and the safety of employees working within the Metro's right of way. I would also suggest that other aspects of the rider experience are critical to create a safe metro system. Working to reduce crowding and improving service reliability along with ensuring clear and direct timely communications with riders will all greatly improve safety. Crowded platforms, crumbling tiles and broken elevators and escalators pose threats to customer safety that while not as dramatic as last year's crash, are just as dangerous because of their ubiquity. We are encouraged that Metro is taking steps to improve communications with riders in terms of safety and security. <laughs> Earlier this month, Metro unveiled signage that prominently feature the telephone number for the Metro Transit Police to help riders report problems or safety concerns. This example of a rider-suggested change will directly improve safety for Metro's customers. As it rebuilds its safety culture, Metro also needs to rebuild its culture of customer service. Employees, especially those actively engaged with customers, will be better able to recognize and correct potentially dangerous situations earlier. 
In addition, an organization that listens to customers, addresses their concerns, makes it more likely that those customers will identify and report safety concerns. Metro's 1.2 million daily riders represent 1.2 million pairs of eyes and ears on the system every day. This is a resource that cannot be taken for granted if Metro truly wants to become safer. The Council is also encouraged by Metro's recent efforts in tracking and reporting safe service and safety. The new monthly vital signs report provides a clear, timely snapshot of Metro's performance. Metro must make this available to all its stakeholders if they want to improve performance. Ensuring sufficient capital funding for Metro is necessary to improve safety. The Council appreciates Congress's support of the $150 million annual federal capital funding and hopes Congress will continue to provide these funds, especially as they will be directed towards safety. We are also encouraged by the Metro Board's approving a $5 billion six-year capital funding agreement. I thank you for your, this opportunity to provide testimony and would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilbernardo. Could I ask a question of, of the entire panel? Um, since the June 22, 2009 uh, tragedy, in your view, has, uh, is Metro safer than it was? I'm not asking for, for absolutes here, but is it safer, safer than it was? And uh, I would like you to describe briefly uh, if you think it is safer, why? And if you think it is not safer, why? Uh, Ms. Herzman? Yes, ma'am. I think clearly uh, Metro is in a much safer position uh, today than it was uh, in June of 2009. Um, I, the reason I would say that is because I think they're aware of many of the deficiencies that exist on the system, whether it's track circuits uh, or challenges that they have within their operation, communication, uh, making sure that maintenance procedures are clear. Um, they have done a lot of learning in the last uh, year plus, and I think that uh, always every organization is going to go through a difficult time after an accident. The question is how you react to that accident and what changes you make. And I believe that the Metro Board um, was very willing to listen uh, to the Safety Board after our report was concluded, um, and they have taken many of those lessons uh, to heart, and I think that they're beginning uh, to make many improvements that have been long overdue. Thank you, Ms. Herzman. Ms. Hudgens? Um, I, Ms. Norton, yes, I believe that we are, uh, as an agency as well as our board, a safer environment for uh, our customers. I think we most specifically have to talk about the fact that immediately after the accident that there has been a constant attention to uh, uh, the testing that needs to be done for the uh, trains to ensure that they do, the accident should not happen again. But more importantly, I think the board has been focused. Uh, as I noted in my opening point, we have uh, already uh, changed our committee so that we can make sure that safety and security is foremost in, in the work that we are looking at and that we can get the kind of information that was brought out in the NTSB that uh, we need to hear as well as uh, the whistleblower piece that allows our uh, workers to be willing to report information freely without punishment. And I think those are very important pieces to start us on what I think is rebuilding the culture that's needed for safety in our organization and throughout the uh, board and relationships with our customers. Mr. Sauls. I believe we are a safer organization, uh, but we have a long way to go. Um, some of the things that have been done is including, you know, with regard to specific incident, we monitor our system much better than we did. We've uh, started more training. There's improved communication. Uh, we've taken some actions, uh, you know, to, uh, such as ordering new cars. And one of the important actions, which I mentioned in my testimony, was the appointment of a chief safety officer, which with much experience and bringing uh, other people into this organization have many, many years of experience in the rail operations and safety. 
and that person reports directly to me has a lot more independence and strength than the, than occurred in the past in this organization. So some of those are some of the things, but I emphasize it's a start, it's not an end. Uh, Speaking on behalf of the Oversight Agency, I would believe that, yes, they've made significant progress. They are a safer organization than they were on June 21st. I think it's worth noting that the uh, Metro is unequivocally the safest way to get around the National Capital Region and has been for a very long time. But I think they've made uh, notable progress, in particular in the areas of um, switching their focus from what I would characterize as occupational safety, uh, where they were primarily concerned with um, numbers such as slip tr slips, trips and falls, workers' compensation injuries, which, while important, uh, do not reflect uh, an approach to analyzing systemic high consequence threats to the system such as June 22nd. Uh, the addition of the expertise that Mr. Sarles mentioned has really permitted them to bring their safety office up to a very high level of technical proficiency in uh, the matters, uh, in particular with rail safety, uh, that will help them analyze uh, such hazards in the future and, and prevent them before they ever pose a risk to passengers. Thank you, Mr. Hester. Mr. Garland? I, I would have to answer that uh, twofold. Um, I think in a worker's capacity, which is what I, I was hired as a bus operator, um, the agency is safer because of the awareness that, that the uh, system gets on a daily basis in the media or incidents that happen on a daily basis. But I would say that as far as the workers are concerned, the ones who do the work, um, there's, there's this element of, 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 of the workers not being confident in, in the agency as far as being able to uh, uh, protect their safety and, and their health. And the underlying issue is when they're doing their daily operations out in, in the system, um, there's, that, there's that element of always looking over your shoulder as to what else is out there. So in, in that sense, you, you're working on the pressure as a worker as, you know, what is out there? I know that the train system is in a manual mode, and the train operators basically uh, uh, run the system through the manual mode, but there is that element out there, what's out there, and, and that is a safety issue. So uh, until we, we address the, the, the workforce and reconnect with the workforce as to uh, training, as to recertifying, building the, the morale of the workforce and, and reconnecting with the workforce, th that element is always going to be there. We always talk about the funding of the system but there's that element of the human beings who do the work. And until that's addressed, the money portion really is like opening a window and pouring it out of the window. If you, if you have complacency with your workforce, you, you, you must get reconnected with the workforce and, and, and reinstill in them what, what they're doing on a daily basis. So in that sense, I'd, I'd say it's, it's unsafe in that sense. Mr. Garland, Mr. DiBernardo. Yes, <clears throat> yes. The Riders Advisory Council believes that um, the agency is safer in practice, in policy, and most importantly, because of their willingness to be accountable and uh, and transparent. Now, Metro is 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 faced with a very difficult issue. Um, uh, in testimony from um, one of you, or perhaps. This is is just what I remember. There's something like eleven billion dollars. Is that <coughs> uh, in in um, um, funds that are needed in your capital program? Now, the Congress has authorized uh, only one point five billion over uh, ten years, and as as I understand it, the region would put in another. 1.5 billion dollars. You now have, so let me begin at the, at the micro level. You now have from the region, let me see, 600 million last year, is it? And 600 million, we believe, this year. How should that money be spent? Anyone can answer that, uh, who feels that, 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 that they can, but we'd like an answer to that because Somebody has to figure out, given the enormity of the need, with, I must assure you, uh, faced with a deficit and a recession, not much hope that the Congress would pony up more money. Uh, we are aware of your own difficulties. 
certainly not of your making, but there they are. And so you're not going to get more from the writer public than you're already getting. Mr. Durbinato Dur will be probably be the first to tell you. Uh, so in a climate of uh, extreme scarcity and great need, somebody has got to figure out where these scarce resources go. Is anybody figuring it out? And one way to do so uh, is since you've got money in hand, is to say, where is that money going to go? Um, um, Ms. Norton, uh, Congressman Norton, I, I think uh, when we look at our approved capital budget uh, and we look out over the, the uh, six years that we have, we have tried to uh, uh, focus those resources in many of the areas that were raised by the NTSB. Uh, if you recall, uh, over six years ago, the, re the Metro Board uh, developed a Metro Matters, and it was funded really from the, the uh, jurisdictions, the uh, Metro Compact members. And what we are acknowledging is that that $1.5 uh, billion over the 10 years is indeed a uh, very important piece of what we are doing. We just have to admit that there, it is still not enough. And it's, unco it's uncomfortable to say that when we recognize how much we need to do. Yeah, and that, we but don't want to hear that. <laughs> well, I uh, because, because we don't want to raise hopes here. So we, we, we need to know how you're going to spend that money. How, have you budgeted the, 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 first, the first two years of money or the first year of money? Have you spent the first year of money, for example? We have budgeted, and, and Mr. Sauls can go over the, the estimates that are part of the NTSB uh, recommendations that I think are very critical in addressing this problem. Now, we recognize that, that you're dealing not only with funds from Congress. Mm -hmm. I'm asking about our funds. Uh, the appropriators will want to know, for example, as we struggle, and it is a struggle each year, to get each $150 million out, well, they're going to ask for accounting on their funds as if their funds were the only funds in the whole world, when, it, when as, as your own needs indicate, they are a fairly small part of, of the funds you receive and need. Uh, so Mr. Saul, so if the appropriator were here, he'd say, how did you use the first $300 million and how will you use the $300 million for this year? All of it is devoted to safety and state of good repair projects. An example of where a good chunk of money is going is to uh, purchase the cars to replace the 1,000 series cars, which is our top priority and, of course, an NTSB recommendation of long outstanding uh, time period. So that is where it's going, safety, state of good repair. In fact, if you look at our entire six-year, $5 billion capital program, it is all devoted to safety and state of good repair. Now, we are, do have the NTSB recommendations I outlined before that we're going to move ahead on all of them. We know already that there's roughly $150 million that wasn't accounted for in our budget because obviously we didn't know exactly what the recommendations were. We're going to have to deal with that and reprogram because we are going to do it. I'm sorry, I, there were, what, what that was not accounted for in your budget? It's about $150 million that will have to be spent as a result of the NTSB recommendations. Uh, capital Above money. and beyond what? What we had budgeted. So for we're this going year, to have to for this for which years? Over the next three years or so. The entire program is six years, but it's really things that we want to accomplish in the next two or three years. So we're going to have to look at reprogramming that. And obviously, if there are other funds become available, that would be very helpful. Beyond that, uh, there are certain recommendations that we're following through on, such as a system safety plan, uh, system safety testing and analysis. That as a, as a result of that, we may have other uh, conclusions that come out and other findings that say we have to spend additional money, but that we will not yet be able to determine until we've completed those analyses. Uh, Ms. Herman, uh, your report is truly excellent. It's the kind of roadmap that I believe will probably be used uh, by other systems as well, particularly since you cautioned other systems when you were early on, and we certainly thank you for your early discovery and uh, uh, your, your announcement that other systems which had similar tracking systems need, um, need be very cautious. That's very important national uh, announcement that you made. What, what it, of course, uh, indicates to the subcommittee is, the, is that you are, uh, have the kind of knowledge of these systems around the country that none of the rest of us uh, including, I'm sure, many, many at Metro have. I'd like to know, <laughs> um, you have to forgive me, 
I, I still uh, am a professor at Georgetown and I always mark on the curve. Uh, so I don't want to <laughs> compare, compare my own students to the perfect. <laughs> Uh, I, I, you know, I, I look across the board and I say, <laughs> compared to what? It's the only fair way to judge, even though we want people to reach beyond where the best are. And I'd like to ask you uh, today, with the improvements that have been made as of now, how Metro would rank compared to the systems that we are most familiar with, like Chicago, like um, New York, um, um, Boston, the kinds of systems. How would you rank the, the, uh, our metro system today, given improvements that they've made, consciousness they have, with these systems far older and apparently haven't had the same uh, issues? <coughs> You're kind of asking me to pick amongst my children a little bit. Um, right. uh, certainly, Metro is a system that I and many of our employees use um, every day to get to work, and so it's one that we're very familiar with. But I will say we investigate accidents um, in transit properties all across the country, and so we do find uh, failures and lapses. Um, we find deteriorating equipment um, and challenges in those uh, systems. Um, it's very simple things sometimes like distractions, like a train operator that might be texting while they're operating a train and they hit another train. Um, those are not always things that cost a lot of money or have anything to do with the age of the system, but they involve the human beings that are involved. So it's having good um, procedures and good systems. Um, I will say that there are many other transit properties that are learning a lot from this investigation on Metro. Well, um, Mr. Herzman, would you make us understand, uh, and perhaps we just don't know, uh, and this was so dramatic and inflammatory, why haven't we had such crashes in New York uh, and, and in Boston? Is it because they have a safety culture that we do not have? I think it's hard to say, um, but they have not had um, certainly the overall number of accidents that Metro's had. Certainly the June accident, 2009, was very spectacular, but Metro had three other events Your after that. Your report noted, uh, uh, and over and we're talking about one spectacular event, but how many events did you note over the years? Um, well, over the over the years since the accident, there were four no, incidents that we even investigated. Since the accident. Yes, even three since three additional accident. that we investigated on Metro property. So that and before the accident, there were about how many? Uh, we investigated two track uh, worker uh, fatality events: one on uh, the yellow line, one on the red line. We also had the Woodley Park uh, accident where we had the train roll back. Fortunately, there were no fatalities on that, but. The number of accidents that Metro has had is unusual compared to the other properties around the country. Are you satisfied uh, that, uh, with, with what you know, that Metro is, sp is spending the first of its funds in the right places? I think it's really up to Metro to prioritize what they're ready to roll out. Um, in terms of safety, do you think? Yeah, in terms of safety, I think it's. I think Mr. Sorrells and his team are in the best position to know uh, what they're ready. You know, what projects are ready to go and what things are ready to roll out. Um, one of the things that doesn't cost any money, and that's what the Metro Board is moving forward with, is beginning to change that safety culture from the top down. And I think this goes to Mr. Garland's comments. You've got to in involve the whole organization in this process. You've got to bring the employees to the table for this to be effective. And so those are things that may not be very expensive, but they are going to take a lot of work. And I really did appreciate what Mr. Sorrell said, is that they have a lot of, of work yet to do. And I think that's exactly the right attitude. Mr. Sorrells, how will the the workers be uh, involved, more involved with Metro, not as adversaries. Apparently, there's been some adversarial, uh, 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 there's been some a adversarial feeling. Uh, Mr. Garland says that there should be, you know, a member of the board. Is there any system that you know where workers are represented on the board? And if not on the board, how would you? Uh, make sure that workers had a buy-in to the system. 
think there's a number of things that uh, can be done, and in fact, we have started on, on a number of them. One is what we call safety conversations, where we are in strongly encouraging uh, workers among themselves, as, as well as between supervisors and workers, to talk about safety issues when they arise. I'll give you an instance of what, for instance, of what that is. I was out one night uh, looking at construction work, and I happened to step over some tools. And uh, one of the folks uh, came up to me and said, you shouldn't have done that uh, because you could have stepped on the shovel and smacked yourself in the face. That's a safety conversation, but it's that kind of thing that we have to encourage. In addition, at our facilities, there are meetings that go on between the supervisors and the workers, their safety committees to discuss what issues are coming up. Now, it's important not just to have the conversations and talk about what the issues are, but then to act on those issues and to give that kind of feedback to the workers. And that's the direction we're moving in. I wouldn't say it happens all the time, every place the way it should, but that's the direction we're moving in. We've established um, senior executives, uh, say, superintendent uh, report out committees where I go and listen once a month to what the issues are and, and this uh, reflects the conversations that are going on in the safety committees as to where the trends are, where there are issues, and where there are successes. I think importantly, which uh, I have some experience with at my last job at New Jersey Transit, we were the first commuter railroad to introduce the non-punitive reporting system. We did that last year. We worked on We signed up that agreement with. Who did that? I'm sorry. New Jersey Transit, mm -hmm. commuter railroads. First commuter railroad in the United States to do that. We have discussed that with the leadership at 689. In fact, uh, I shared with them uh, that agreement, and that's the kind of thing I'd like to see happen myself. Now, so this is what I'd like to get to the bottom of. We don't think that there's a non-punitive culture at at, at Metro mm -hmm. now, and, and the words are thrown around, and I am not sure what they meant. In fact, the, the close, the, the 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 only understanding I have is what you, Ms. Herzman, uh, indicated, and the way it, uh, she gave me to understand it was not simply talking in generalities about culture, but by describing other forms of transportation. And I wish, Ms. Herzman, for the record, you would tell us about non-punitive. Uh, systems in other modes of transportation. I do not think the public understands it any more than I did before I heard what I regarded as a very clear statement from you, and I've not heard any here uh, today. And it would it would elucidate our record uh, to know by way of example what a non-punitive culture is by reference to other forms of transportation that have uh, such systems in place. How do they operate? Thank you for that question. I'd be happy to explain because we think that they've been very successful in other modes of transportation. The close call reporting system is being used in the rail industry, um, in the freight rail industry. Um, certainly, Mr. Sarles has some experience uh, with a commuter uh, now, rail. A close call would mean, for example, if I am Mr. Garland and I had a cross call, quote, close call. And who knows it is Mr. Garland and maybe the other driver. They just come forward and say, I had a close call. Absolutely. Well, you need to set up a structure uh, where the employees feel comfortable reporting this. And I can give you a couple examples in the aviation industry because we also have a very mature um, non-punitive reporting system for pilots. We have one in existence also for air traffic controllers. But when we talk about pilots, the important thing is sometimes there are things that go on that no one else might know besides the people who are in that cockpit. Sometimes there's things that other people know about, but what you need is you need more information really to understand what happened and why it happened. And so it's not about letting people off, it's not about um, avoiding discipline, but it's really about the organization being able to learn about mistakes or failures or systemic procedures that don't work or that aren't being applied. And so we can look at two aviation accidents and, and look at how they might have been treated um, differently based on the circumstances. Um, one involves uh, two pilots who overflew their destination, Northwest 188. These are real events. Um, last October, um, they overflew Minneapolis by about 100 miles. They did not respond to air traffic control hails for over an hour, and they didn't realize that they had overflown until they got a call from the flight attendant and said, should we begin preparing the cabin? And they realized, oh, so we've overflown. 
they had taken their laptops out and they were talking about new scheduling procedures and they had gotten distracted from the task at hand. Around the same time, we had another uh, airplane coming in from South America on an overnight flight. Um, they had a senior pilot, a third pilot in the cockpit with them who got ill, had to leave the cockpit. They were coming down to land in Atlanta Hartsfield about 6 a.m. in the morning. They'd been flying all night. They got a change of assignment and runway, um, some information as they were coming in. They landed on a taxiway at Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, our nation's busiest airport, on not on the runway, but on a taxiway. They were very fortunate that they didn't have a major accident. Those pilots, they made a mistake. They did not want to land on that taxiway. What was really important about that event is that we learned about why. You know, was the lighting good on the runway, on the taxiway? What were their instructions? Were they in clear? How did they line up? And so we have two pilots. But what about the first one? As I recall, the first pilots were not candid about having their, their laptops out. They actually were. They were forthcoming with the safety board investigators. Um, but they did, um, they did end up getting their license suspended yeah, by the that's FAA. Pretty, that's pretty severe. And that was because they, they knowingly violated procedures. They were not supposed to be, um, they had a prohib prohibition on, in the flight deck by the company, you can't do this. So this would be like a bus driver texting and hitting someone. You don't, that's a violation of procedures, a knowing violation. You don't want to protect people who are violating rules. But on the, on the other situation with the pilots coming into Atlanta, you want to understand why that happened, because they didn't mean to get in that situation. That report was accepted into the system. They talked to the pilots. They counseled them. They learned from that event. And so we say, well, how does this apply to a transit system? How would this you know, work in a transit environment? And I asked another transit operator. I visited some other operators around the country. And I asked a company uh, or a uh, system in another city, how, how, would you, how would you use this system or how have you used this system? And they said, you know, we had a problem. We had some escalators that um, we had, a, had an issue with, and one of them slipped and someone got hurt. And we said, wow, this has never happened to us before. And a bunch of their maintenance technicians said, yeah, it actually has. It's, it happens a lot. We see it happen all the time. And the management team said, what do you mean you've seen it all the time? And the employee said, well, we have this form for reporting if we get hurt. We have this form for reporting if a passenger gets hurt. But they didn't really know how to put that information up the chain that an escalator had slipped, but nothing bad had happened. And so the operator said, wow, we really need to be able to get this information. We need to be able to pull this information in before something bad happens. That's exactly the kind of system that they need to have on Metro. So if they have an escalator that's slipping at Woodley Park, they need to get employees who are calling up the management and saying, we're having this problem and you need to help us figure out you know, how to address it. Let's sit instead down and talk of about this. Instead of feeling uh, that the escalator slipped and the first thing you'll be asked is who did it? Well, and we actually saw that in our investigation of the Metro accident. Um, what we saw is that there was a sense that there was a punitive culture if mistakes were made. We talked to the train operator of the standing train, the one that was struck, and he shared with us the reason why he was operating in manual mode. He should have been in automatic mode, but the reason why he was operating in manual mode is because in the past he had been operating in automatic mode and the train overran the place where it was supposed to go in the station and he was disciplined for it when the train was running in automatic. That made him not trust the system not trust the train, and he wanted to be in control and make sure that it didn't overrun so he wouldn't get into trouble. So that meant he was... He That's was, a direct example. He was violating procedures because he was concerned about the discipline yeah. rather than the company understanding we have a problem with these overruns and we need to fix it. And that certainly helped to cause the accident. If he was in manual mode. Well, it didn't, it didn't necessarily cause the accident. He happened to be stopped in that, tra in that track circuit that didn't detect him, yeah. and that was what caused the mm -hmm. accident. But it was a, a symptom mm -hmm. of not addressing problems and, mm -hmm. and employees feeling uncomfortable talking about them. Mr. Sauls, did you look at what the other modes of transportation had done, you and I think New Jersey, because you say you were the first system to have First commuter rail system to have close call where we, right. it, this involved uh, an agreement between the uh, operating unions, the FRA, 
ourselves that people could um, identify and report something that w was something that if could be a hazard or could lead to an accident in the future, but you know hadn't occurred in that particular incident. And by doing it uh, in a way that protected the employees so that the information was provided without them being subject to any retaliation, it's, it's a way to get that information out that the chair of uh, the NTSB just pointed out. And it's, it's the way we should go, and that's the way I'd like to go. Have you initiated such we discussions with the, the transportation transit union here? Yes, we have. We, we meet uh, monthly, and that's one of the things we're talking about. Um, uh, Ms. Hudgens, um, I'm, I'm interested uh, from you and Mr. Sauls that you have looked outside of the agency anytime. I think that's always a, among the best practices uh, to assume that there may be others who can be helpful. Uh, and uh, it is, I believe in your testimony that you describe an, um, an external safety pa a panel pa that, yeah, that right. Metro has formed. And I must say I was impressed with the uh, composition. You, you formed it with help from the DOT, and I hope Metro will, will recognize that it is, the DOT is right here with lots of expertise that can be useful to Metro, but they apparently helped Metro uh, form this panel, and it, it has an impressive across the board membership, AFL-CIO, American Public Transportation Association, uh, to develop uh, strategies for creating this uh, safety culture. Can you give us some information about what uh, this panel is, how this panel is advising you and whether they have in fact uh, been able uh, to move you toward a safety culture and if so, when? Uh, Ms. Uh, Norton, we have the, the uh, panel is working now and, and has been working with our Metro staff and working and looking at our organization. And they are to come back to our board and they, when are they due with, back? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I have a date, the final date on back, but by the end of the year we need to have that back. Because we're in, we're, we're, there are two aspects of this. We really were looking for outside help in order to evaluate what we should set as a standard for our organization, and that starts with the general manager. And looking at a general manager of the future, we want to make sure that this board Where understands. Where are you on the general manager? The general of the manager. And <laughs> when is the future coming? <laughs> well, I, let me first say that we have a general manager in place, and Mr. Sauls has been outstanding in the work that he's done. But he has indicated he is a, not a permanent uh, candidate for this job. So we are working toward the end of the year of finding. Uh, uh, moving forward on a general manager. So you and believe that by January 1st we will have a new general manager for the we hope that, Metro system? We hope that within that time frame we're able to do so. But, but the information that we're gathering is very critical in trying to set some priorities for the organization about safety. And that is what that group is doing in helping uh, uh, the authority in, in its uh, the general manager and his uh, employees, but we're looking for expertise. We're looking for information from uh, this task force that will set forth some guidelines for us. Um, I believe this is yeah, Mr. Saul's testimony, um, or it, it really it comes from really the audit of March two thousand ten. Mm -hmm when 25% uh, of the vacant of the positions in Metro's uh, safety department were vacant and you have testified about James Doherty, the new chief safety officer, and an actual increase of 12 positions. So we'd like to know how many positions remain vacant. Uh, None. And how has that safety, new safety operation been restructured? In what way is it different? Um, there are no vacancies left. All those uh, vacant positions that were talked about were filled, including people who have worked on other railroads and have extensive experience in the regulated environment. Um, in addition, as part of the uh, FTA findings and recommendations, we were to do an assessment, self-assessment assessment of the safety uh, organization. And what we've now completed thus far is looking at the experience of all the people in the organization, what we need in that organization, 
and the additional training that has to be done so that everyone is uh, you know, fully qualified in, in all their positions. They bring a lot of experience, now we're just adjusting it to the Washington Metro organization. Importantly, as I mentioned before, that organization which had sort of moved around, safety organization had moved around different places in the organization, not always reporting to the general manager, it reports directly to the general manager, as well as giving monthly reports to the board. Uh, Mr. Bassett, I uh, appreciate the work that, that you've done, particularly given the obvious handicaps <laughs> under which you labor. Uh, you are, is TOC, well, how many funded positions does TOC have? Um, we currently have uh, two members who are assigned full-time, myself and Mr. Benton. Uh, the white paper as issued in April uh, identifies the commitment from the three jurisdictions to allocate one full-time person um, as well as one person who will provide 50% of a full-time equivalent uh, per jurisdiction. So once the hiring process is complete um, for the District of Columbia, they will have um, three, we'll have three full-time TOC members. Now, Mr. Bassett, you're having to struggle while we in the Congress are trying to create an entirely new system where the local jurisdictions would have to uh, have a fully funded uh, oversight organization or depend upon the federal government and we are giving that option in our legislation at least to the local jurisdictions. You can do it yourself uh, according to regulations which will be at some level national uh, or uh, the federal government can help the local jurisdiction do it. That's just very rough notion of what the statute. So you, you're going to have to hobble along uh, until we get this bill out. Actually, this bill is, is it today it's on the floor? Uh, tomorrow it's on the floor. And I'm, I am, I'm going to go to speak uh, to that bill. We hope to get the bill out of the Senate. So we are very concerned about the, 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 the issues you've had. Why did they have issues after there have been hearings that Mr. Bassett reported Mr. Saul's I th think the, as uh, Matt, uh, Mr. Bassett said, there's been a lot of improvement. And as I said, we're just at the start. Uh, the one issue that uh, Mr. Bassett brought up with regard to the 4,000 series cars, there's two pieces to it. This was the 4,000 series cars that were all taken off uh, offline, right. which would leave any oversight body to want to know why. And they got two or three different answers. And, you know, and w we're left to believe that there were not real written procedures, correct me if I'm wrong, because what the document you got was 